All right. So welcome back to another episode of Behind the Drapes. In this episode, we're going to be talking to Andrew, who's one of our finance gurus here in our residency program. And in this episode, we're going to be covering budgets and how to budget your life. Um, hopefully, we'll be talking about what it's like to budget in medical school and then also the life experience that Andrew and I are both going through right now, which is residency. Uh, so welcome, Andrew, to the show. What's up, Kenny? Good to see you. Good to see you too, man. I, I like the book, the bookcase back there. Yeah, I'm going for uh, talking about budgeting. I've got like my primary vice behind me is always where I blow all my money on unnecessary crap. <laughs> I thought you were going to say all of your finance books that you study. Where, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think I have like two finance books back there. Not like a bunch of fantasy, sci-fi, uh, fictional books. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, one of the first memories I think I have of you in residency is you showing up and telling everybody that your car caught on fire driving from <laughs> Kansas City to Providence. Yeah, that might be uh, an example of taking the miserliness or uh, budget consciousness a little bit to the extreme to the point where it's a little bit self-defeating. I think I went through like three cars by the first six months of residency uh, which is probably not an efficient way or an effective way to practice uh, budget consciousness. A little too far on the cheapskate side of things. Well, yeah. honest, honestly, getting I feel like getting a cheap car is a pretty relatable situation that people can find themselves in, especially when they're going for higher education and you're already strapped for cash or you're in a job that isn't paying so well. Um, so what were like your what was your car situation in med school? So I got really lucky. I mean, obviously, no one in med school is going to be buying brand new cars anyway. So I think everyone's kind of, as you said, in the same boats looking for used cars. Obviously, it's a very different market now in early 2023 compared to when I bought a car in uh, when it would have been like 2016 or something. Uh, but yeah, I honestly, I bought mine off Craigslist. Uh, I found a guy who like treated this Honda Civic like a baby. It had probably 150,000 miles on it when I bought it. Uh, which is quite, but as a Civic, I took it into a Honda dealership, got you know, made sure everything checked out, so looks great, and I rode it for another probably eighty thousand miles before I finally basically just melted the engine, and that was my fault. So I loaded like a million pounds of books on it and was driving through the absolute peak humidity from Kansas City to uh, Providence, and it really couldn't uh, take the load. Uh, so it could have probably driven for another hundred thousand miles if it wasn't for my stubbornness uh, with that. Uh, but yeah, I got pretty lucky off the, off the Craigslist, um, but no shame buying a car with a well over 100,000 miles, as long as it's like a Honda or a Toyota. Do you remember that moment when you were like, oh, crap, I should need to pull over because my car is on fire? Yeah, it was less, uh, it was dread, but more so out of embarrassment than of like a sense of danger because my we were driving two cars. I was driving the Civic. My wife was driving uh, one of my parents' pickup trucks with the rest of our crap. Uh, and she kept saying, Andrew, this, th we can't make it all the way up this huge hill with the AC on, with all these books. And I was like, it's fine. It's fine. Like, you don't know what you're doing. Just So I took over and drove it. <laughs> and we were like in, we were only like three hours outside of Kansas City. So we're around like St. Louis at this point. I remember just like the engine absolutely dying and like the power steering locked up. And so that's when I knew I was screwed. I was on the freeway and the power steering oh. like locked up. And I was like, <laughs> like dang it so i like remember <laughs> drifting off to the side like the highway like very carefully it was pretty uh dangerous in hindsight but more so than the danger it was just the sense of absolute shame knowing that i told you so was coming any minute as soon as my uh -huh. wife pulled up behind me uh, -huh. uh that, that's yeah. what you get for trying to mansplain how to drive a car to her yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> it was it was literally like within under an hour after we just had this argument about it and then there i go killing the engine it literally melted i took it to uh got it towed to like a car repair shop just down the street in st louis and like yeah dude you melted a hole through like the bottom of i don't remember what it was but uh yeah there is no salvaging <laughs> after that. that is that is impressive yeah. Uh, so after that happened, how did you go about getting a new car? So you you basically so, made, made your way to Providence and then found yourself in a job that you needed to get to every day. And so a car was quite valuable. So I assume you had to get a car pretty quickly in that situation. Oh, yeah. And I was such a, and again, this probably isn't the best example of how to be efficient with uh, being you know budget conscious. But I was thinking, I was like, I'm not going to lease a car. 
And so I'll just buy a car right here in St. Louis. It'll be cheaper out here than Providence anyways. And generally that's true. Uh, and I had, you know, a bunch of money saved up, well, not saved up, uh, but a decent amount saved up for like a cheap used car. So it's like, I'll just buy one on the spot cash or something like that from one of these used car dealerships. Like it's cheap. I just need to get me from point A to point B. Uh, so the place I dumped this car, I think they only gave me like 500 bucks for like the parts of after uh, what was left of it. Um, and I just like looked through their, basically their junkyard, what they had. And I found another Civic. And I was like, you know, this last Civic lasts me 80,000 miles. How bad could this next one be? And I think I picked one that had like 160,000 miles or something like that. And I'd struck gold with the last one. That car lasted me probably five years or something. It was just beautiful. Never had a problem with it until I meant to built the engine. So I thought I'd just strike gold twice. Definitely did not. So <laughs> I probably, I think I spent, uh, two grand or 2,500 on this car, which was a lot of money at the time, but for a, you know, a car for all intents and purposes that was working seemed like a good deal. I basically just drove it off the lot from St. Louis and planned on that being my car. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a piece of crap. Uh, AC wasn't working. So it was a blast driving from uh, St. Louis to Providence with no AC in the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure you remember the first, uh, uh, kickback session you had at your uh, apartments like I think within a couple of weeks of starting residency uh, you invited all of our class over and I was excited to come I remember having to text that Friday night is like sorry I can't come guys <laughs> like it was like welded shut on this car so that's how long that car lasted I do so, remember it, that really like a month and a half or something's all I got out of that car so that was a colossal waste of money you were very uh, quickly developing the reputation of the guy with car problems yeah, yeah. So that was uh, that would have been obviously much wiser just lease a car, or rent something to make the trip, and take more of a planned uh, approach of getting a replacement car instead of just buying again. Just thinking I'd just strike gold twice with just a cheap Civic that could could run just into the ground. What did you ultimately end up settling on after that car? Did you buy used again with cash or did you end up um, leasing a car? I got another dirt cheap uh, Subaru. I didn't quite learn my lesson. Although uh, this car I squeezed probably about almost two years out of. And I think I spent 3500 on it. Uh, and then so the the Civic that like basically crashed and burned, I was able to still flip that for 500 So I ended up getting a little bit of money back. And then the Subaru I got with that, I think it was an 07. Uh, also, that one had like 130,000 miles on. I got like two-ish years out of that. And that one sort of, it didn't really die. Uh, but it just, my wife wasn't too uh, excited to be driving there on the freeway. So she basically <laughs> forced me to upgrade. And I had some decent profits from other things coming in. So we got like a real car. And now I drive a 2018 Subaru with nice. only like uh, 25,000 miles on it right now. So nice. I got that for a good deal. Finally got your big boy car. Yeah, like an adult. <laughs> <laughs> so backing up a little bit to when you basically had your first emergence situation, um, you kind of alluded to the fact that you had, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like an emergency fund or a lump sum of cash that was available. Um, my understanding is that you kind of had a non-traditional route getting into medical school where you worked for a few years prior to entering medical school. In that time, is that where you saved up some of your money that you had away in your savings? Uh, sort of. So I worked one year before med school as an English teacher in Japan, which is a lot of fun, but not great for making a lot of money. I honestly probably only had like five grand saved up from that whole year going into medical school. Um, but I was really budget. Con I picked so my med school. I specifically went back to the state of Kansas, which is where I'm from, for med school for in-state tuition, even though I was an undergrad out in Southern California. And that was a conscious decision. Not that I got accepted to a million med schools, but between the ones I was accepted to, I specifically chose the cheapest tuition. Mm -hmm. I think that paid dividends. Um, I like lived at home for a year during med school as well. Um, things like that. My wife, uh, when I got married during med school, my wife had a job too. So that was nice for saving up. I had a couple uh, things I did to earn money whilst in medical school. Um, between that, yeah. The idea was, yeah, again, always to have sort of an emergency fund saved up, generally a month or two's worth of expenses uh, for situations like that. When you're which I kept burning through. <laughs> 
from the cars or from other things as well. Yeah, bring through like three of those emergency funds in the span of a year. So, <laughs> sorry, guys, maybe that strategy wasn't working. I'm just going for the absolute cheapest car possible. <laughs> or you're taking advantage of the concept of saving up for the emergency fund and not letting it go to waste. What was that? Sorry, I said. I said, or you're just taking advantage of the fact of having an emergency. Oh, that's true. Fund. Yeah, <laughs> putting it to good use. Yeah, yeah. Um, cars every couple months. <laughs> When you're in medical school, uh, did you take loans out? And when you took loans out, did you also take money for living expenses out? Yeah, so I did. Um, I took loans out for everything. I mean, I got some scholarships. Uh, everyone at KU got some form of state scholarships, but it was usually pretty pithy amounts. Uh, like it was um, using more than like four or five grand. I think the most I ever got one semester was like 12 grand. But even in-state tuition, uh, with the total cost of tuition and living expenses, it was probably 50K a year, give or take, and much more towards the end of fourth year when you have to worry about flights and all these, you know, USMLE expenses, et cetera. And that was entirely through loans. Uh, I was able to at least get it all through the the normal federal loans. I didn't have to apply for the additional, I forget what they're called now, I think like the Perkins loans or something like that with the higher interest rates. I was able to keep it within... Uh, just the explicitly federal loans, uh, the interest rates are like 6.8% or something. Still high, but not as high as they would have otherwise been. And that was, yeah, in my entirety of med school is through loans. And when you were trying to figure out how much to take out for your living expenses, were you calculated in that decision at all? Yeah, I tried to kind of look at what I was spending in college and extrapolate that into medical school. Um, I severely overestimated my frugality in med school compared to college, where obviously you're just I was living in dorms with a bunch of guys, didn't really have to drive a car around or things like that. Uh, when people would get drinks, it would be, you know, beers in the dorms. It wouldn't be going out, you know, to proper restaurants or pubs or anything. Uh, so my first year, I ended up having to go reapply for more loans. It was still well with under uh, the amount permitted for the estimated cost of living. But it was definitely above kind of what I had personally estimated my living expenses would be based on, uh, you know, my time in undergrad. Um, but then the subsequent years, I feel like I was pretty uh, bang on with how much I would need for, you know, transportation, food, things like that. And then at least having a little bit set aside for emergencies. What do you, uh, if you had to pick like either a top three or top five things that your budget went towards in medical school, what would you say your priorities were? Yeah, I mean, outside of obviously tuition itself, biggest things, I mean, for everyone besides rents, uh, food, like eating out, those are easily the biggest things. Uh, then there's smaller things people don't think about. Obviously, the phone bill is a pretty big chunk, but all the additional subscriptions that you, those pile up pretty quick, $6 here, $12 there. So I nixed all of those right out of the get-go. So I don't have to worry about anything except just my phone bill and my internet bill, uh, utilities bills, et cetera. Um, but yeah, eating out, I tried to minimize things like alcohol. It's another thing people will spend tons of money on if you go out to drink. So we'd always try to drink at you know the house or the apartments or wherever I was at uh, paying rent for. Uh, food as well. I mean, it's no, there's no secret. So uh, meal prep was a huge thing for me. I'd make all my stuff on Sunday and just eat that for pretty much the whole week. It's pretty boring, but very cheap. I do that for lunch and then my roommate would usually make meal prep for the dinner. And so we kind of alternate that way. Uh, that's probably the biggest ways I'd save money is not drinking out at least very much and hardly ever eating out. So I feel like people burn money through those by far and away more than anything else. Oh, definitely. And like, I feel like the more you drink, the more you just want to spend. So it's uh... oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's like a perpetuating vicious cycle. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then were you saying that you were saving a little bit of money too on the side? Yeah. So I like, uh, you know how, when you apply for the loans during med school, you kind of, again, you, you can get, they give you like the maximum amount for what they, es the estimated cost of attendance, which includes tuition and what they estimate the cost of living to be. So I'd kind of, I never quite had to take out more than that, but I'd take up enough and I'd try to leave myself, uh, I think it was something like 2k per semester is what I at the time thought would be sufficient for like an emergency expenses because at the time you know I'm not married on a kid so I mean it wasn't didn't have any perceivable like health problems to really think about is more for things like if something happens to my car or need you know some repairs and like the house I was renting or things like that that I was more worried about cool 
And so when you were transitioning from being a fourth year in medical school to now you're a resident making a salary right around 60K, what were some of the biggest changes you saw in the way you were budgeting your life? Yeah, so I think uh, especially fourth year, that's when uh, I'm sure you can obviously relate. That's when it's no longer monopoly money. It's not just blank checks from the government. It's now it's your money that's coming and then leaving your hands. In addition, well, it didn't affect us too much as far as the loan repayments, given all the pauses during COVID. Uh, That kind of made it way more real. Like, okay, now this is money. uh, Not that it wasn't money before, but now it's more tangible. It's like an actual paycheck. Um, So now I just started thinking about how am I going to start filing taxes? How am I going to tackle loan repayments? And just sort of going through the thought process of all that early on was really good to kind of nail down a budget going into things with regard to, you know, the loan repayments, uh, things like health insurance through uh, they're not quite as cheap, uh, but at least better than what you'd get as a med student, disability insurance, life insurance, things like that, which I didn't really ever think about as a med student. Do you ever use apps or have a way of like going through your current like monthly budget to see how you're spending money? Yeah, so I used, I think it was called Mints. I think it's still called the same app today where it would kind of, you just punch in your bank information and just kind of automate uh, what your expenditures would be at the time, like eating out, leisurely activities, bills, utilities. But it wasn't super useful at the time because 90% of the things I do, I just put on a credit card. It's for credit card points. Uh, so then it would just have this, you know, like 80% of every single uh, monthly feedback thing would just be other because it wouldn't be able to break down the individual credit card stuff course you could put in your credit cards and then it could break it down but i'd be changing credit cards every three to four months that was incredibly tedious so i ended up just having like a basic uh i did an excel file for probably the first uh probably first six months of fourth year of medical school just to kind of track and then average how much i was spending and do it that way but after honestly after the first six months or so i stopped using excel files and just kind of went uh based on what i'd historically done and assumed it'd be uh, in a ballpark of that. So I didn't have quite the granular data that I previously mm-hmm. did. Although my wife keeps a very uh, detailed Excel file of her expenditures down to the penny uh, every single week for everything. So that kind of balances out my sort of more vague uh, uh, accounting, I should say. Uh, speaking of your marriage and finances, I think there's probably two avenues people can take in their relationship, and that's either sharing your budget or kind of having separate budgets um what do you and liana typically do so we separate our budgets uh almost well we obviously we share like the cost of rents uh utilities things like that but she has her own bank account i have my own bank account her paycheck goes there my paycheck goes here um that's i guess easier to keep account of what we're each spending um probably is the main reason we do it that way uh, and it's also, I think, easier just to kind of keep t- tabs on each other, like who's, you know, being more frugal or who's maybe not being as frugal. Um, I think it's a huge benefit and probably the single biggest thing for budgeting, saving things in general is if you're with someone is to have someone who's of a similar mindset. As I'm sure you and Lily can definitely relate uh, as far as being on the same page financially is probably the biggest thing by far and away that affects uh, finances. Uh, early in your career, mid career, and certainly late career. Uh, yeah, we've yeah. kept things generally separate, not by any explicit intent, but we've just never bothered to combine our finances. And it's worked out pretty easy for us so far. It's so true what you're saying that if you're scared to talk about finances in your relationship, eventually it's going to boil up and come out when you least expect it. So it's a healthy practice to have open conversations about finances. Oh, yeah. And early on, too, for sure. Uh, any cons that you see with separate finances? Um, so I don't think in terms of finance, like financial health, I don't think there's really any cons keeping things separately. I guess if I was worried about her uh, spending money on things or if she was worried about me spending money on things, you know, frivolously, uh, that might be an issue because it'd be hard to keep track of you know, making sure we're both pulling our weights or as if it was in the same bank account or the same credit cards, it'd be pretty easy, easy to see, obviously, the statements. But neither of us are obviously worried about that at all. Um, not really so much related to financial health, but she's from England and kind of getting her over here with the green card as we got married and all of that. 
Uh, did make it a bit trickier by having separate bank accounts. I think if you have uh, joint bank accounts, it makes that whole process a lot easier. There's more of a paper trail to kind of prove a codependency with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not so much related to financial health, I would say. I don't, yeah, but otherwise, I don't really see any cons to it, honestly. Okay. Cool. Do you and Lily share uh, accounts or do you guys do. keep it separate? No, you we do? do. We do. But our bank actually allows us to, we have two separate credit cards with each of their own numbers. Um, and so on the statement, you can see if like either Kenny made a purchase or Lillian made a purchase. So you can kind of like uh, I nice. eyeball it that way, um, but it, it comes out of the same pot. That makes sense. Yeah. Leanna does send me, so she's the one who takes care of the rents and the utilities and she sends me a bill every month uh, uh -huh. to transfer from my bank over to hers. And likewise, I'll send her a bill if like I'm the one uh, paying for the uh, food or whatever. We don't get too granular about it, but we like to try to keep it even. So it's not just tanking one person's account versus the other. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, that can always be a little bit annoying getting like a bill from my wife uh, every month or vice versa, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, that's amazing. When we go out to out to eat for dinner, I'll still grab the uh, the check from the waiter and say, "Oh, don't worry, honey, I got this one." <laughs> uh, I'll do the right. same thing and then send her the bill like two weeks later. <laughs> send her a Venmo request. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, all right, so just to wrap up a little bit, what is a piece of advice that you would leave with the listener? Um, that you think was really useful in just setting yourself up to have uh, financial health or uh, living financially well in your life? Yeah, I think no one's going to care about your financial well-being, period, but certainly no one's going to care about it more than you yourself are going to care about it. So it behooves you to take an interest in it earlier than later because none of your medical advisors, your instructors, none of them are really care about it. They care about you, but not that aspect of you. No financial advisor you ever have is really going to care about it because they're incentivized for their, you know, they get the, make sell you the, the deals, the products, things like that. Um, so unless you want to be, you know, being played, basically, you kind of need to take an interest in that very early on. And a huge, the absolute foundation of that is learning how to budget, learning how to save, make sure you pay yourself before you pay anyone else with uh, each paycheck, whether it be, you know, retirement, emergency funds, uh, making sure you have money to kind of do the things that you want to do and not just, you know, losing it daily to things that don't really bring as much enjoyment like eating out versus eating at the house. How much more enjoyment are you really going like eating out several times a week versus just, you know, maybe once. Uh, same with drinking out versus, you know, drinking at the house, uh, things like that. And then same with even the bigger budget things like the car, where you go to med school, where you go to residency, uh, things like that. Those uh, kind of pay dividends down uh, the road in terms of how much money you will or won't have uh, based on those decisions. Solid, man. Real solid advice. All right. Well, yeah, Andrew, we're going to have you back in a future episode where we're going to be talking about one of your or maybe multiple of your side hustles. Um, but I think that adds to sort of the coolness and the uh, wealth savvy factor that you carry yourself with. Uh, so just as a little bit of a sneak peek, can you describe your side hustle in one word? Uh, so the one I'm doing right now is basically a consulting job. Uh, one, right one, now word. One, one word, one word, one oh, word. Uh, uh, <laughs> Google, I guess, would be the most interesting <laughs> word. All Google's right, perfect. We'll choice. leave it. We'll leave it right there. All right. All right, man. Talk to you later. See you, man. Bye.